The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At that time in his teaching, Jesus said to the crowds, Beware of the scribes who like to go about in long robes and to have salutations in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, the poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. Her whole living. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one, explain the key message of the second reading of today. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, 28. Question two. From today's first reading, and the gospel passage, what can you say is the relationship between a person's faith and trust in God, a person's faith and trust in God and his or her capacity to be generous, to be generous and to engage in sacrificial giving. What is the relationship if there is a relationship between a person's faith and trust in God and the extent to which the person can engage in sacrificial giving? Question three. The widow gave all she had because she understood that, quote, giving liberates the soul of the giver. She understood something that many who hoard do not understand. Giving liberates the giver. Discuss. And question four. As the conduct of fundraising takes on increasingly scandalous and sometimes even blasphemous dimensions in some of our churches, what is the Lord teaching us today about Christian giving. Yes, Ebenezer. Glory to Jesus. Well, I want to attempt question four. Christian giving. If we look at the first reading and the gospel, and all the reading, um, Christ is trying to tell us or to teach us that when it comes to giving, there's always conditions that can keep us or discourage us from giving. There will always be conditions of insufficiency. In fact, as human beings, we are never sufficient. But I always say it here that all of us are poor before God. And God is aware of that. 
And we also need to know this as Christians that when it comes to giving, we cannot give conditionally. If we want to give conditionally, we will not give. Just like the widow of Zarephath. He has a condition, he has the last meal, the last oil to spend. And she has no other source where she can expect to get a replacement from. But when Elijah appeared, and it is God that appeared at that moment, and gave her his word, she believed. And then set aside the condition and presented the meal before Elijah. And eventually God manifested himself. So this question number four, the word of God and Christ is trying to teach us that we should not be lobbied or cajoled or calculate before we give. We should give unconditionally. Thank you, friend. Give him a round of applause. Yes, sir, Archie. Glory to God forevermore. I'd like to attempt question two. From today's first reading and gospel passage, what can I see is the relationship between a person's faith and trust in God and his or her capacity to be generous? For me, generosity is both a fruit and an expression of faith and trust in God. Fruit? And an expression of our faith and trust in God. Because oftentimes, people are greedy and they keep or try to preserve or hold what they think they have because they have built their trust on the ability of what they have and not on God's ability. So when we actually trust that God is our source, He's the actually he's the all-sufficient one, and we are not sufficient in ourselves. The expression of that trust is that we are readily and we readily give. And also, the Bible says that Christ came and he gave himself for us. So if we believe in God, if we believe in Christ, and we say we follow in his example, then our lives will also bear the fruit of generosity. There is no faith and trust in God without living a generous life. The two go hand in hand. Well, like you said, it's actually the fruit. I mean, Jesus says, by their fruits, right. you shall know them. So, it's not just that the two go hand in hand. One demonstrates the presence of the other. Meaning, sacrificial giving, generous giving, demonstrates that you have faith, faith. and trust in God. So, that, that's, that link is a very powerful one. And one of my questions could have been, what is the link between the second reading and the, and the other two? And the link between the second reading and the other two is precisely this. That God gave his son sacrificially. Gave his only begotten son sacrificially. And we who say we are children of God are to follow God's example. If we are to be truly Christians. We are to follow God's example. If I run a applause. Yes, Tony. You know, she said something about, about greed. And Ebenezer said something about insufficiency. We always have a feeling of insufficiency. Is that not why there is no, no amount of billions that Nigerians are not capable of stealing? No amount of billions. So people steal and they steal. And they steal, they put in water tank, they put in septic tank, they put whatever. No amount people cannot steal. Once we are plagued by that spirit of insufficiency, you know, you, you know that you know that many of us behave like rats. There is, there is in the genes, and they say it's in the genes of many people. There is in the genes of the rats. Something tells them, something in their genes, in their memory tells them that it will not be enough. That there will be scarcity. That there will soon be famine. That there will soon be hunger. So what does the rat do? The rat gathers and gathers and gathers 
for the rainy day in case of the hard times coming. Just keep gathering. Apart from gathering in the mouth, and you see it's storing things in the mouth, it also gathers in the hand. That, that thing is actually genetic. It's there. Then we study, you can Google it and see. We study that a number of greedy human beings, sometime in their ancestry, there was starvation. You can Google it. It's, it's been studied. Sometimes in their ancestry, there was starvation. So something keeps telling them that even though they, have, they are in millions now, that something is going to happen and they will have nothing. So they need to hoard. So hoarding has a genetic... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, has a genetic dimension. Something keeps telling them that there will be hunger. He's a millionaire. He's a multi-millionaire. But something keeps telling them that something will happen soon in our country. Something will happen and they, they will have nothing. So they keep gathering and gathering. May the Lord heal us of this genetic menace. So that we will trust. We will trust that it shall be well. That it is all right. That before this one that I have finishes, the Lord will provide. May we trust like that so that we may be less greedy. Amen. Yes. May the name of the Lord be praised both now and forever. Amen. Uh, permit me to attempt question number one. I think the key message of the second reading is like a contra contrast between the Old Testament, where the high priest has to offer sacrifice, not of his own blood, but of blood of animals, first for the forgiveness of his own sins, then before he atones for the people. In contrast with Jesus, who is now the great high priest, just like two Sundays ago in the order of Melchizedek, offering his own blood, a one-off sacrifice, for atonement for the whole world and for our redemption. Now, thank you, uh, Tony, for that. Um, I keep telling you that if you really want to understand the, the distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament, read the book of Hebrews. You know, I keep saying the Old Testament and the New Testament are not the same. But many people don't understand that. Now, if you want to recognize, understand the difference, read the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews was written for Hebrews. To say, in the old time, among your people, it was like this. But Jesus is the priest that is a much higher priest, supremely higher priest. It's not of the same level as the priest you had. The sacrifice that Jesus has made is not on the same level as the sacrifices you used to have. You used to have a multiplicity of sacrifices, but Jesus has made one single sacrifice of himself. So that distinction, throughout the book of Hebrews, you keep seeing it. To make it clear that there is a big difference between the sacrifice of old and the, the new sacrifice. The covenant of old and the new covenant. The testament of old and the new testament. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Yes, Robinson. Praise the Lord. Lord allow me to add my voice to question number four. Yes. Um, at the moment, uh, is a period of harvest and bazaar in so many churches. And uh, when you visit this harvest and bazaar, the kind of things you see happen as a way of generating income. Some of them very scandalous and far away from the teachings of Christianity. I think what we need to do is to teach our people more that giving in Christianity is not a give and receive arrangement. I give and I receive. Because God has given us so much already. And so what we do in giving is to appreciate the so much he has already given to us. No matter how little we think they are. And so... That, that giving in Christianity is not... How did you put it? It's, it's not, not a, a giving give and, and receiving. Yeah, and receiving, yes. Not transactional. It's not transactional. Exactly. So you give generously. And give even if nothing is going to come. Exactly. Ah, me, I was at an event a few days ago. 
I was at an event a few days ago, and they gave awards to about 60 people. But as they give you award, you come out and announce how much you are giving. <laughs> eh? It's called quid pro quo. I give you award, you announce how much you are giving. And it's a church event too. I give you award and you announce how much you are giving. I give you award, you announce how much I give. I sat down there and I said, mm, we have failed to teach our people how to be generous. This is the problem. So, people are going to, I mean, somebody comes to ask me for money because it, to, to support him because he's going for a wedding. And you know what he does? He brings a bottle of wine. I'm saying, what is this? That part of our culture, needs, something needs to be done about it. Because, you see, people are not learning to simply give. So you give and you must take something home. Let's teach our people to just give. And trust that the Lord will replenish them. Yes. Look at the, the gospel. The first reading and then the gospel. The two women there, they gave out of nothing. The little they had, they gave. And they were not cajoled. They were not, you know, brainwashed to give. But what we see going on today is people are almost hypnotized to be able to give, even in the church. And so people are employing all kinds of gimmicks just to make people to bring out what they have. And so we just have to go back to catechesis. To we go back to the basics. Go back to the scriptures where Jesus says... Do not let your left hand, Matthew chapter 6, verse 3, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is giving. I think many of us, many of our churches, many of the leaders, we don't read that part of the, part of the gospel. Give him a round of applause. Yes. Question 3. Glory to Jesus. Um, I would like to add my own perspective on question 3. So having heard or read about the story of the widow, we understand that God is not necessarily concerned with our gifts, regardless of the quantity or how much it is. God is concerned with our heart, the disposition of the giver. And then, talking about giving liberates the soul of the giver. Giving makes us satisfied. It makes the giver fulfilled accomplished, and then leave the giver happy. Praise God. Giving liberates the soul of the giver. Hoarding, hoarding enslaves the soul of the hoarder. Oh yeah, that's the contrast now. If giving liberates the soul of the giver, then what does hoarding do? It enslaves. It enslaves. Give him a round of applause. <clears throat> At a time of acute famine, when people were dying of hunger, and you know what happened? I hope you know the story. The king went and married Jezebel, a pagan person who brought paganism to the land. And it was this same Elijah that prophesied that there will be no rain until I decree that there be rain. You remember that? It was this same Elijah that prophesied that there will be no rain in the whole of Israel until I prophesy. Until I decree. And you know, there was no rain. One year, two years, three years, there was no rain. Elijah himself became hungry. Yes. But God sent some ravens to provide him food. And when that food was finished, God now directed him, go to the, the widow of Zarephath. That is outside Israel, and he will provide you food. So Elijah went. He went with faith and trust. 
He went with faith and trust that God will provide him food. And God didn't dis disappoint him. As he entered that town, as you can see, can you see everything dry there? Evidence of famine, everything dry. As he entered that town, he met a widow gathering firewood. And as a stranger, he didn't know this woman. This woman didn't know him from Adam. He asked the widow to go and make him a meal. He actually, he first of all asked the woman, go and bring me water to drink. The woman said, was going. She was going to bring the water. He said, hey, not only water. Make me a meal. And the woman said, all I have left of food is this small flour and a little oil which I am ready to go and cook. I'm gathering these sticks to go and cook and eat with my son and die. Because this is the last. The stranger insisted that she should go and prepare him that last food that he has. Go and prepare that for me first. After you have prepared that and brought for me first, then afterwards, you can go and find something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the jar of meal will not be emptied, the jug of oil will not fail until the day the Lord sends rain on it. She went believing, right? She went with faith and trust. To do exactly what the prophet told him to do. By the way, Ebenezer, you said that she knew that it was a man of God. There is no indication in the story that she knew she was talking to a man of God, right? She was just doing that for a stranger. As Elijah said, the jar of meal was not emptied. So as she collected from the basin some, to, the, the, what she thought was the last to cook for Elijah, the thing was still remaining. So she went and gave Elijah. She came back, she cooked for herself and her son. The thing didn't finish. And she kept cooking and the thing didn't finish until rain came. It is an amazing story of generosity towards a total stranger. The heart of a generous person invites a miracle. Do you understand? A generous heart invites a miracle. If we allow our hearts to be generous and reach out, it will invite miracles. Help me tell the greedy people, especially our leaders that steal three quarters of their people's money. I mean, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing that one leader after the other, at the end of their reign, when they no longer have immunity, then you now start hearing of the billions while the people are living in acrimonious poverty, in destitution, in dehumanizing destitution. That kind of heart doesn't invite miracle, does it? The widow was not a Jew. The widow had no business with the Hebrew prophet of all his mission. So if the prophet was going to preach somewhere, that was not the business of the widow, right? She was just being generous to a fellow human being in need, which is what we all require, which is what our leaders require, which is what those who have in our society require, to simply be generous to a fellow human being in need. And the, 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 the human being in need <clears throat> Is the one Jesus refers to when he says, as you did it for the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Her generosity was spectacular because she herself was in desperate need. Who told you that only those who have can give? It was John Paul II who said, no one can be so poor that he has nothing to give another. And no one can be so rich as not to need something from another.
And our prayer should be, Lord, don't allow me to get so poor that I, don't, I cannot help others. If I am materially poor, then give me something for others. Give me courage to encourage others. Give me words of comfort to encourage others. Give me, give me some spiritual gifts so that I can support others. But don't allow me to be poor in every department. God forbid, right? To be poor in every department that I have nothing for anyone. Her generosity was spectacular. I say she brought out her last cup of grains and jug of oil for a total stranger. The prophet too had an amazing faith and trust in the promises of God. He went to Zarephath empty-handed, trusting that God will take care of the situation. So, the combination of the widow's amazing generosity and the prophet's audacious faith and trust produced the miracle. Okay, so the gospel now. At offertory time in the temple, Jesus observed the rich putting in lots of money. Though they put in lots of money, that money was a fraction of their riches. Then came forward a poor widow. She put in two small coins. Now, the reason is that as Jesus and his disciples sat down there in the corner, when you put in coins, it sounds. The kind of sound you hear will tell you about... <laughs> Yeah, it's the sound you hear. Because the velocity of the, of the sound will tell you whether this was one pound or one shilling or one penny or shishi. She came forward and put in two small coins. And these two small coins, the Lord knew that it was all she had to live on. Jesus noticed her. He called the attention of his disciples and told them, you see this widow? She is the richest donor. The highest donor. The most generous of them all. Highest donor because the Lord is looking at what you have given in the context of what you have. <clears throat> That's what makes her donation the highest donor, right? She, he is looking at what you have given vis-a-vis -vis what you have. Now, the one who has given 5% of his riches has not given anything near the one who has given 95% or 100% of the riches. While the others contributed money from their surplus, the widow dropped everything all she had. She was ready to let go every shred of security. And the word security is important because it is it is security when people want to be secure. That's why they are often not generous. Her two coins were worth more than all the donations of the rich. For Jesus, true generosity is measured not by what people give, but by what the, giver, what the giving costs the giver. And what the giver has left after the giving. Can we repeat that together? The true generosity is measured <clears throat> not by what people give, but by what the giving costs the giver and what the giver has left after the giving. True Christian giving is not giving what we can do without. You know, in those days when you call for when you call for, oh, bring some clothes and some whatever for, for some vision, they call for the poor. People will bring, people will bring things that are meant for the dustbin. And if there are shoes, they will bring, I swear to God. And we kept saying, and I, and I think we improved in this church. We kept saying, no, 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 no. You want to give your old clothes to the poor, you have to take it to the dry cleaner and clean it up, and iron it, and present it like new. 
Don't treat the poor like trash. Treat the poor with dignity. So you are giving something to the poor, give it with dignity. True Christian giving is not giving what we can do without, but that which we very much need, that which will hurt us if we part with it. Those who hoard don't part with anything that they think they might need someday. A generous person gives out what he needs now and again, but he says, well, I will do without it. God looks not at the greatness of our good works, but at the sacrifice that went into them or the love with which they are performed. And so, something like taking a risk to pick somebody who is stranded on the road. It may be a small thing, but because of the risk involved, we do it, and it's a huge, it's a huge act of generosity. Because of the risk that you took to do that. In a world of excessive preoccupation with results and achievements, Jesus uses the poor widow to teach us that it is not the result that matters. It is not the size of the offering that matters. It is the effort that went into it that matters, not the result. Against the showmanship of the scribes, And the counterfeit piety of the Pharisees, Jesus projects this poor widow as the example of true piety. I hope you know that he had just finished having a serious argument, having a serious conflict with the Pharisees and the scribes. Against their showmanship and the counterfeit piety of the Pharisees, Jesus presents this poor widow as an example of true piety and generosity. Apart from giving all she had, there is also this dimension. The widow was pure in her intentions. And you recognize that Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they are the ones who shall see God. Whereas the rich often gave in order to retain their status in the public eye, <clears throat> the rich often give in order to retain their status, which is what people exploit in churches too. They, they, they have seen, you know, it's like the, 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 the hunter has learned to shoot without missing. The bird has learned to fly without perching. The rich often gave in order to retain their status in the public eye. That's why you want to collect money in this country. What you do is organize a launch event, a launch, which you call launching, so that people can come and do like this, and do like this, and announce that I and my Lolo, <coughs> my humble self, that we donate to this. My humble self, I mean, these are not evidences of humility. But it will still say, I and my humble self. My humble self. They do it to receive the applause of the people. And people actually do applaud them. And Jesus Christ says, you have already received your reward. And yet, people don't, people don't let that scripture sink in. The poor widow gave what she did with the best of intentions. Pure intentions. Believing that she was not going to be noticed. She didn't imagine she would be noticed. And she was not noticed by the big people who were there, of course. Even though in the Judeo-Christian religion, widows, along with orphans and strangers, <clears throat> are recognized as the poorest of the poor, and believers are constantly urged to demonstrate their faith in God by their generosity towards widows, in today's reading, however, the widows themselves are the ones showing incredible generosity and teaching us powerful lessons. You see how Jesus inverts the order, turns the upside, order upside down. The widows that the scriptures constantly told us to be generous to 
they are now the ones that are teaching us generosity. It is the nature of God to be generous in sacrificial giving. See our second reading, Hebrews 9, 24 to 28. Therefore, we, God's children, are called upon to follow God's example of what? Sacrificial. What does sacrificial giving mean? It means the giving that hurts you. If it is giving that doesn't hurt you, that's not sacrificial. Every sacrifice is painful. Every sacrifice is painful. Giving in a manner that hurts you. That's what the Lord God did. That's what he calls us to do. The poor widow is therefore presented to us as a model of Christian giving. So the poor widow is a model, is an exemplar of, of Christian giving. Note that in contributing resources for the church's work or donating for charity, Christ seriously detests any form of vanity and vainglory, pomp and showmanship, or self-indulgence seeking of attention and desire for honor or applause. And yet, yet we are often so guilty of this. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 3, your left hand should not know what your right hand is doing. And today, in some churches, there are people who are told to carry their money and raise it up so that others will see it and copy them. You see, your left hand, is, how do we, is this Greek? Is that not simple language? Your left hand should not know what your right hand is doing. So sadly, these days in our society, some church leaders directly encourage, directly promote such vanity and showmanship in the conduct of fundraising. And I have constantly cried out, you know, I have constantly cried out against the many abuses associated with annual harvest and bazaar or the launching of building projects in our churches. I'm sure you will remember. You remember that three years ago, I, I told you I sent a memorandum to the Bishops' Conference of Nigeria. And I issued a video, it was recorded here, against the vanity and vainglory that goes with giving. Christian giving should be seen as a sacred devotional enterprise. It's not an occasion for the display of vanity and vainglory. Can we read that together? Christian giving. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers, I am compelled once again, after reading this passage on the widow's might, Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44, as I did three years ago, I am compelled once again to give my critical appraisal of and condemn in the strongest terms the abuses that now characterize the conduct of fundraising in our churches, especially also annual harvest and bazaar. Yes, as I said three years ago, I sent a memorandum to the Bishops' Conference of Nigeria asking that they put necessary measures in place to regulate the conduct of fundraising and annual harvest in our churches. I also released a video in which I made a passionate plea to priests and pastors of churches and lay leaders, church council officials on this matter. I am not sure how much of the abuses have been eliminated in our churches. So, I will make my plea once again. People have now taken it for granted that it is normal to have very cumbersome announcements and elaborate arrangements that precede harvest each year. Whereby, for many, many weeks, and even for months, precious worship time, precious time that is supposed to be for religious instruction, it's expended on preparing church members for Harvest Thanksgiving and Bazaar. In the process, unfortunately, 
the sanctity and the integrity of the liturgy are sometimes violated. In the process, a dose of vanity and vainglory and showmanship, they are accommodated just so that more money could be raised for God's work. Sometimes secular celebrities, including comedians, are brought in to ginger the church members so that they may contribute more. But I will ask today the same questions I asked three years ago. Why do adult Christians who have some means by the grace of God why do adult Christians who have anything to give, why do they have to be pursued? Why do they have to be cajoled? Why do they have to be harassed? Why do they have to be blackmailed before they donate generously for the work of God? That is, if they believe that it is the work of God. Why does an individual have to be called out five or ten times during one mass? before he hands over what he has decided to give for annual harvest. True, I consider the carnival-like environment and the sheer entertainment, vile entertainment tone that Harvest Thanksgiving and Bazaar has taken in our churches these days simply ridiculous. I believe that things could be done differently. I believe things should be done differently. I believe that we could be more faithful to Christ even in our fundraising enterprise for church projects. There should be a difference between the way money is raised for church projects and the way money is raised for secular projects. There should be a clear difference. Since we need money to do God's work, fundraising enterprise our fundraising enterprise in the church should be considered a missionary task, a sacred devotional enterprise, a holy enterprise. Those who help to raise funds for church projects should see their work as sacred enterprise. Finance council members, harvest committee members, Church council members, those who help to raise money for the church should see the assignment as a sacred devotional enterprise. And when such fundraising is conducted during liturgical celebrations, I mean like during mass, it should be seen as an act of devotion. It is part of your devotion. And let me read once again, somebody whom I said has made the most profound statements about fundraising for church work, for God's work. Henry Nguyen, 20th century celebrated re retreat preacher and mystic. He reminds us that fundraising in the church is, quote, proclaiming what we believe in such a way as to other offer other people an opportunity to participate with us in our vision and our mission. Church fundraising is proclaiming what we believe in such a way as to offer other people an opportunity to participate with us in our vision and mission. He says, quote, church fundraising is the opposite of begging. Church fundraising is the opposite of begging. When we speak to people about raising funds for the church, we are not begging. What we are saying is, please, could you help us out because it's been hard? No, we are not saying, please, I beg, help us because it has been hard. No, rather, what we are saying is, we have a vision that is amazing and ex exciting. I have a vision that is extremely amazing and is exciting. I am inviting you to invest you, yourself through the resources that God has given you. Your energy, your prayers, and your money in this work that God has called us to do. 
Then Newell reminds us that to be converted means to experience a deep shift in how we see, in how we think, and in how we act. To be converted is to experience a profound shift in the way we look at life. Finally, St. Paul says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It is the same St. Paul who says in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 5, that the world may be evil, or that your lives should redeem it. The environment may be a environment of vanity and vainglory, but your own life, your faith life, should redeem that world and not just join the bandwagon. I have constantly said here, and thank God, I think most of you agree with me in this respect. And for many years now, we have been conducting our harvest in a completely different way. I have constantly said here, when we need something, when I need something for my project, I need something for the church, I will, let, I will tell you, if you have and you can, you support. If you don't support, well, it's okay. God will make sure that his work is done. God will make sure. If you, are not, if you have and you refuse to be part of it, who loses? You. Because God will bring people to get the work done without you. And once we recognize that, we recognize that it is God's work, it's not my work. If I am not asking for money to go and buy Lamborghini, to go and buy Mercedes Benz to use for myself, if I am asking for money to buy batteries, solar batteries to run the church, you contribute. If you don't contribute, God will bring people to do his work outside you. That's my position. And that has been my position all the years. And God has never disappointed me. Do, do I look like a begging priest? <laughs> do, 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 I look, uh, do I look like a begging priest? Ah, God has never disappointed me. So, let us take the word of God seriously and act according to the word of God. We are already, we have a problem that people come to church and they hear the word of God and they live differently when they go out. But now, we are bringing the ethos of outside, we are bringing them inside the church. And so, at this time that churches are celebrating harvest, I continue to plead with the leaders. I continue to plead with the priests and pastors. I continue to plead with the church leader, church council persons, finance council people, let us conduct these things in the Christian manner. Let us teach the world how to be generous. Let us teach the world sacrificial giving. Let us teach the world how to give and not, re and not receive a, a, a award in return. This nonsense of anybody you want to, to come and give you money, you have to give the person an award. You prepare plaques and give a word before people give you money. This is it's an abuse. And when that is done in church, it is terrible. Look, Stella members, help me tell your friends in other parishes that this is unacceptable. The church is supposed to be a living, helping to transform the world. You shouldn't bring the vanity of the world into the church. Let's, not, let's stop this nonsense. I mean, we keep complaining that uh, our country is going down the dogs, I mean, the drain, and uh, things are not working well. How will things work well when you are bringing the evils of society, the vanity of society, you are bringing it into the church? Destroying the integrity of our worship. May the Lord help us. I believe that Luxera members have accepted this, haven't they? May Luxera members also help us to tell friends outside so that they too may accept that we may be agents of transformation for our society. I keep saying this point. The gospel of, the, of Christ, the gospel of, the, of Christ is the most potent agent of social transformation. The gospel of Christ is the most 
potent, most powerful agent for individual and social transformation. But we have to leave it out first. Before, when people see us leaving it out, then they will embrace it and it will transform their lives too. Now, lessons on, on generosity. In summary now. Can you read? Number one. Two, true generosity comes from the heart. To be generous, one needs not be rich. Three, with all we have, our time, our resources, our love, our understanding, our forgiveness, our patience. So it is not just, it is not just those who are rich materially with money. Every one of us has something that others need. Our patience, our forgiveness, our understanding, our love, our resources, our other resources, our time. Number four. But from our substance. Give not just from our abundance, but from our substance. Five. The giver is as enriched as the recipient. Six. But no one can love without giving. Seven. Wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. You can see that a lot of our corrupt leaders are poor, isn't it? From this point of view, they are poor. Wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few ones. You are rich when you don't need too many things. Do not pass a man in need, for you may be the hand of God to him. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. Generosity is what keeps the things we own from owning us. Again, from owning us. Uh, this, was, this was by a church in Canada. What's this? If you are more fortunate than others, build a longer dining table, not a taller fence. And in our society, it used to be so. In our society, those who were more fortunate than others used to have a bigger dining table and fed hundreds of people. But now, those who are fortunate, more fortunate than others, they build higher walls to keep the poor away. Next, if you want love and abundance in your life, give it away. If you want love and abundance in your life, give it away. Next, the path to heaven is paved with generosity. And but on the love with which is given. And I think we all know this. Sometimes we all know this. That the value of a gift does not depend on its absolute worth. But on the love behind the giving. Giving is a heart issue. It is a matter of the heart. We need to deal with and conquer several indulgences in our hearts to get to the place where we are able to give like God gives. So we need transformation. We need conversion of the heart in order to be able to give as God gives. The kind of giving that is worthy of God. The kind of giving that is described in today's second reading. Sacrificial giving. Love is a basket of five loaves and two fishes. It is never enough until you give it away. If you start sharing today your little blessings, you will be amazed how it will multiply. Oh, a thousand fold and more left over. You will be amazed how it will multiply. You will be amazed 
how it will multiply. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you once again for confronting us today with this powerful readings of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath and the widow in the gospel. The poor widow who gave everything she had out of trust and faith and confidence. Lord, give us some of that trust. Give us some of that faith. Give us some of that confidence in your providence. Give to all Nigerians and to people across the world who have the faith and the trust and the confidence in your providence so that we may reach out readily to those who are in dire need. You have provided the resources for the world. Though the world cannot take care of the greed of even one person, the world can take care of the needs of all. Teach us all this fundamental truth so that we may learn to share. Help us, Lord, as we raise money for projects in your name in the church. Help us to do it with decorum, with devotion, with the spirit of holiness. Help us to learn what true generosity is. That true generosity is sacrificial giving, not a quid pro quo, not one that we will receive applause and adulation in return. Through Christ our Lord.